Hey everybody, Matt Koval here. A couple of announcements before we get on with the Undead, the second Undead video. First of all, Adventure Lookup, I know I mentioned it before, but it is live and it is working and thousands of people have used it to find adventures for their D&D game. In case you don't know what it is, AdventureLookup.com is a site that we created, the community created, to allow you, the Dungeon Master, to go and with whatever arbitrary criteria match your needs, search for and find an adventure that is that ideally saves you a lot of time in running D&D. You think it would be cool if your players assaulted a wizard tower, or if your players had an adventure on a ship on the way to, from point A to point B? Well, you can search for all these things on AdventureLookup.com. It'll search the entire, you know, the entire history of adventures in D&D. It's a, as somebody on Twitter recently put it, it is a bafflingly comprehensive resource. And you get a really good idea of what's in this adventure. It lists all, all the major magic items, all the cool monsters that you fight. You know, if you want to fight, you know, they're fighting Vecna in Critical Role. If you want to search for all adventures that feature Vecna, you can do that. I'm super proud of it. There's still a lot of work to do. I mean, it's totally functional right now, but we want to do stuff like add, you know, the feature adventure of the day and give things ratings, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And that requires programming help. And really, there's one dude who's been doing the vast majority of the work, a guy named Christian. So if you are someone who is inclined to help and has the skills we need, please come by. I'll put a link to the GitHub in the doobly-doo. We're using PHP Symphony 3 uh, SAS and NPM, which I have no idea what mean. If you want to contribute, you can check out the list of bugs and feature requests on the GitHub and just fork the repository. And when you're done, submit a pull request against the official repository, the dev branch. And then once that gets approved, then your changes will be merged. That part, I know what all that part meant because I do develop video games for a living. Secondly, the Strongholds Kickstarter is on its way. I don't know exactly when it's going to start. It depends on how long it takes us to get answers to questions like, how much does it cost to print a book? How much does it cost to ship a book? And there are various solutions for these things. And we are in the process of getting answers to all these questions. And once we have good answers to these questions, the Kickstarter will start, I think, in the next, I've been saying two weeks now for a couple of weeks, but it could actually be two weeks from now. Who knows? I don't know. But if you want to know, there is a link to uh, our website and you can give us your email. And I swear to God, we will only use your email to send you one email, and that is the Kickstarter is live. So if you want to get an alert, an email alert when the Kickstarter goes live, come by MCDM Productions, uh, link in the doobly-doo. We have a logo designed by my friend Tom Schmuck, who is ideally will be a player in our future D&D uh, &D stream. I say ideally because the future of the D&D &D stream depends on us finding studio space, and that costs money. In fact, it can cost a lot of money because they want you to sign a lease, and that means paying a certain amount of money for three to five years, which uh, is a huge ask for me personally. And hopefully the Kickstarter does well enough that we can put some of the funds from that toward finding the space. That's my hope, but who knows? All right, let's get started with Undead video part two. This is not, by the way, this is not a comprehensive, exhaustive analysis of all the Undead in D&D, just the ones people tend to use the most, and specifically the ones that I tend to get confused. We did zombies and skeletons and shadows and specters and wraiths. And people in the comments made the point that specters and wraiths don't kill you or turn you into specters just by dropping you unconscious. They have to use their life drain on you enough to lower your max hit points to zero. But hopefully you don't need me to tell you that. Hopefully you're not using these videos as a substitute for the monster manual. These videos are like a tour. We're just, we're just visiting. We're not moving in. Onward and upward. Ghasts, ghouls, and whites. None of these guys are insubstantial. Ghouls are sort of like zombies for higher level groups. They're CR1 and they could be used as minions for a higher level group. I want to make sure people understand the principle of minions. Any monster can be a minion. It's all a matter of perspective. For a first level party, ghouls are supposed to be a tough challenge. But you can imagine how for like a seventh level party, a bunch of ghouls would be a nuisance. Something you as a DM deploy as cannon fodder in a larger battle with more powerful enemies. And do you really want to track individual hit points in a situation like that? That's a great opportunity to use ghoul minions. An ogre is a challenge for a second level party, but that same ogre would just be a nuisance for a 10th level group. Feel free to use an ogre minion with them. Some players don't like that, and I get it. That conceit of this thing was super tough when we were low level, but now one hit kills it ruins the suspension of disbelief for some players. But for others, it reinforces the cinematic nature of the game, in which you can imagine Achilles or Ajax wading through a sea of ogres, no problem. I remember watching the Fellowship of the Ring movie and the death of Boromir scene, which I think happens off screen in the book, but we get to see it in the movie. And before the orc archers showed up, I literally thought, my God, how many, how many orcs are enough? Answer, none. Literally, no number is enough. Those are minions. Anyway, back to Undead. 
Like a lot of undead, ghouls are easy to hit, AC 12. And like a lot of corporeal undead, you could give them armor if you want to make them harder to hit. The thing that makes ghouls a challenge is their paralyzing claw. I love describing a ghoul's thick, heavy, black fingernails. That description is usually enough to let new players know this claw attack is going to do something funky. It's amazing, really, how much of being a dungeon master is just finding ways to describe things in an evocative, narrative manner that nonetheless draws the player into making a game mechanical conclusion. One of the things I love doing. I've always enjoyed giving the players the minimum information necessary to get them to draw their own conclusions. At first glance, it seems like a ghoul's paralyzing claw could lead to a death spiral, but not really. First of all, the players are likely to make it. The DC is only 10, which means that even with no bonus, you've got a 50% chance to save. And like a lot of ongoing effects in D&D 5, you get to save every round thereafter. Actually, it's it's more than 50% because uh, average average on D20 is 10 and a half. So 10 means you are likely more than likely to make it. And we'll do a video, by the way, on dice math for new Dungeon Masters because knowing... Stuff like odds and probabilities and averages is incredibly, it's way more useful, I think, than something like the CR system. Anyway, I'm not a huge fan of these save every round thereafter mechanics like the ghoul's paralyzing claw, because mathematically that means players are usually only affected by whatever it is for one or two rounds. And to me, that means the players rarely get the chance to deploy any of their other cool tools like lesser restoration. That spell becomes a lot more useful when stuff like ghoul paralysis lasts a minute Period. Currently, I play by the rules, but I would certainly consider removing the save every round component of some of these spells and monster abilities. Also, also, according to the book, ghoul paralysis only lasts a minute. Okay, good. But how do the players know that? New players, especially, I love not telling them the durations. How would they know the duration if their characters have never fought one of these things before? Maybe let them make a skill check. Religion for undead. But watching the players freak out thinking the paralysis is permanent is fun, especially knowing it's not permanent and their alarm is harmless. It's alarmless. Okay, so ghouls are basically tougher meteor zombies who can paralyze you. They can claw or bite, but not both at once, which is basically choosing between doing a lot of damage or potentially paralyzing, which is sort of a sign to me that they expect you to use a bunch of these guys, so some can choose damage and others can choose to attempt paralysis. Ghasts, on the other hand, are really actually nasty. They're they're twice as nasty as ghouls, according to the rules. Why might that be? Well, they have better stats, for one thing. Higher AC, more hit points. They're stronger, they're more dexterous. They're also more intelligent, although ghouls aren't mindless. But it's because they stink. And they stink. Thank you, Lord. You have, to, you have to save every round when you're near one of these things. Otherwise, you are poisoned for one round. Saving every round is pretty annoying. But once you succeed, you don't have to save again. Now, we might as well mention that the poisoned condition imposes disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks, but not saving throws. I think given that saving throws are based on your abilities, it's easy to conclude that a saving throw is a kind of ability check, but it's not. Attack rolls, ability checks, saving throws, all different. Ghasts are also resistant to the turn undead ability, which is cool, even though there's no obvious reason why they should be. The key here, and a hint at how to build an encounter with these guys, is that ghasts are resistant to being turned, and they make all ghouls within 30 feet resistant as well. So you put, say, four ghouls and one ghast together, and that's a party. Or six and two if your players are tough or numerous. That would be a great encounter for tactical players playing on a grid, because suddenly where everyone's standing becomes important when ghasts stink within five feet and empower ghouls within 30 feet. Want to buff your ghasts? Here's a super easy but effective way. Increase the radius of their stink. The greater the radius, the harder they are to fight. Also, and this is something easy to miss, elves are immune to ghoul paralysis, but not ghast paralysis. There's a mnemonic trick you can use to help you remember this, and that is just remembering that elves are immune to ghoul paralysis, not ghast paralysis. It's not much of a trick, really. Don't know why I bothered to bring it up. Okay, that's ghouls and ghasts. Whites are the other corporeal infantry of the undead and the toughest. Whites are CR3 and natively wear armor and take half damage from non-magical weapons. So these guys are the heavy infantry of the undead world. They have sunlight sensitivity, but how often are you going to find a white at a baseball game? Like wraiths, whites have life drain that works basically the same way as a wraiths, except you have to wait 24 hours before someone killed with life drain comes back. And even then it's just a zombie. Pretty anticlimactic. I just find it hard to imagine this coming up. I mean, dying is either permanent, because you're low level, in which case, who cares if you come back the next day as a zombie, you weren't going back to work anyway, or you have access to raise dead, in which case, 
who cares that you died in the first place? In other words, I find a white's life drain to zombie cycle to be a huge edge case that in practical terms is never going to be a thing. It's cool to fight a white. You might, you might fight a white. Uh, uh, if you do it in the next couple of hours, you, you might fight a white tonight. Uh, and if, if it is of a uh, higher than normal intelligence, then you might fight a bright white tonight. And okay, if, <laughs> if you, you were a player in your friend's game and he killed your character using a white and now you're DMing for him, then he might fight a bright white tonight out of spite. <laughs> Whew. Oh, that was, uh, that was, it's all downhill from here, folks. Might as well stop watching the video. Anyway, the show must, um, Go on. it would be fun to encounter a white who has some zombie minions and realize or discover that these zombies are a previous adventuring company who lost a battle. Neat. But are your players ever going to be materially affected by a white's zombie ability? Well, if we make it so it happens instantly or as an action like a wraith and they come back as a ghoul, now we're talking. That's a pretty nasty white variation. So maybe award more XP for defeating a Colville white. You know how I like to give my players magic items early? Now you sort of know why. Moving on, Banshees and Ghosts. These ladies are awfully similar, and this video is basically an attempt to sort all these undead out, so let's figure out what makes them different. They're both CR4 in Corporeal Undead, which is exactly why I confuse them. Both Banshees and Ghosts take half damage from basically everything except magic weapons. I always enjoy describing what happens when you use non-magic weapons against an incorporeal undead like this. You could just... Well, you could just do nothing and be a dick and do all the math yourself behind the screen without telling your players anything. But typically, I think the DM just says your weapon doesn't seem to fully affect the creature and calls it a day. But it's more fun for me to describe how your sword slices through the diaphanous ethereal creature. It slows as it passes through the ectoplasmic form and the creature's mouth forms a silent scream. But it doesn't feel like connecting with flesh and your enemy seems only partially diminished. It's faded somewhat. Your blade doesn't cut flesh, but reduces the undead sense of self to the point where it becomes slightly more transparent. Anyway, their AC is basically the same, 11 versus 12. Banshees have more hit points, but only by 13. They have the same movement, 40 feet of flight. Their stats are basically identical, except for one minor but interesting point. Ghosts have an average strength of 12, but Banshees are strength 1, which means ghosts, though incorporeal, can affect the normal world if they want to. Banshees cannot. The book says Banshees are elf maidens cursed into undeath for the crime of using their great beauty for evil instead of good. The sheer magnitude of jokes available to me is so vast, I find myself unable to pick one. They both have some weird perception. Banshees have detect life and ghosts can see into the etheric plane. Banshees and ghosts both have horrifying visage by which they can cause the target to become frightened and run away for possibly the entire battle. Beautiful, unattainable women who, once you get to know them, reveal their true horrifying nature. That reminds me of a story. Does it now? Hmm. No, it doesn't. Where am I? What day is it? Who are all you people? <laughs> but seriously, folks, I'm not going to criticize the game for making both these monsters female in the art and then giving them both horrifying visage because we got bigger fish to fry in this day and age. Just be aware that there's some semiotics going on here and consider making the ghost or banshee a boy. Can't a boy elf be cursed for having weaponized beauty? You know, that explanation sounds more dumb the more I think about it. Don't overthink this stuff. Sometimes a cigar is just a pipe. So far, these two are basically the same. So what separates them? They each have one nasty ability. Banshees can wail once per day. And if you fail your save, you die. Not if you fail your save by more than five, like a Medusa, just straight up, give me your character sheet, rip. That happened to me, by the way, well, my, my character, just walking through the woods on the way to an adventure and a random encounter banshee wailed and my character instantly died. R.I.P. me. Of course, this was a wizard of mine who eschewed daggers and staves and preferred to use a weaponized yo-yo in combat. I am, I am not making that up. So I basically deserved it. In my defense, I was a teenager. I wasn't that young, though. I was pretty stupid. No idea how our DM put up with us. And by us... I mean me. So, Banshees are a whole heap of bullshit. Uh, I don't like the sound of him. He sounds like a whole heap of bullshit. I know I said no profanity, but I feel like it doesn't count when it's the Mighty Boosh. Banshees can ruin your player's day, so use them <laughs> sparingly. I think this is one of those monsters I'd try to make sure the players had some warning about, especially if they're fourth level or lower and don't have magic items yet. It's easy to look at the DC of 13 for this and conclude your players are likely to make it, but they all have to save, and the consequence of failure is maximal. So, twice warned there. Ghosts are more interesting because they don't insta-kill you, 
They possess you, which is neat. It has a lot of opportunities. When the players in my sandbox game negotiated with the ghost of the mayor's husband and swore to avenge him, they earned the title The Revenant Vow, which is still an awesome name for an adventuring company. Later, after avenging him, he returned the favor by possessing Calarol the Vile at a critical moment and letting the players attack him, which was epic. Possession can be super, super bad because now the ghost is driving the PC's body around and it can do whatever it wants and there is no whole lot the party can do about it. According to the book, the ghost can't use the possessed character's abilities, but I think maybe it can. This is another Colville variation. How often is this going to happen? Bust out something cool. Let the ghost cast spells and use class abilities. Why not? I don't know, maybe it's bad enough. But the point here is, this is a huge narrative opportunity. Consider all the cool things that can happen when a ghost possesses a hero. What if the party doesn't realize? What if you keep it between you and the player, and they get to roleplay being another character in their character's body? Tons of fun. Maybe a PC encounters a ghost while they're off by themselves and returns to the party different. Different how? Just different. The ghost has infiltrated the party. To what end? I don't know, you tell me. And what if that ghost has all sorts of knowledge about the adventure? This is a very cool and fertile way to get information to the players in a memorable role-playing scenario. The player intoning the horrid history of this place they're exploring and the hideous evil slaughter that happened here eons ago. Imagine the party has recruited an NPC they trust only to fight a ghost. Someone gets possessed and the ghost declares the NPC a traitorous villain responsible for killing the ghost in life and leading the players to certain doom. Or, the ghost possesses a PC and threatens to end the possessed character's life if the players don't aid the ghost. It's a hostage situation. Give me what I want, or this meathead fighter falls on his own sword. A lot of these examples, I'd make the player complicit in the fun. Players, in my experience, love that. But the point is, there's just a lot of great role-playing hooks with a ghost that aren't spelled out anywhere. You know, the ghost and the banshee have the same amount of text, Basically the same stats, they seem essentially identical, but the Banshee is far more deadly and the Ghost has way more role-playing opportunities. Wouldn't it be nice if the Monster Manual just said this stuff directly, instead of spending its word count on lore? I think it would make life easier for DMs and more dramatic for players, but what do I know? I think it's a mistake to deploy a Ghost just as a random monster. Ghosts need backstories, don't they? So tie the Ghost to the place and come up with their original name. How were they murdered? This should be part of the adventure. Ghosts and Banshees are both intelligent, which means, to me, they can be negotiated with. Banshees, we're told, are evil, but ghosts can be any alignment. Don't miss the opportunity to make a ghost a character with a backstory. Your players will love it. Bodax. This is a beastie found in Volo's Guide, and it's pretty cool, by which I mean interestingly nasty. You can be nasty without being interesting, that's just hit points and damage output, and you can be interesting without being nasty, a cool ability on a weak monster, but the Bodak is both interesting and nasty, and to me, that's pretty cool. It's sort of a Colville variant on its own. I think it's worth throwing into your stable of undead, where you keep your undead horses, obviously. The fluff says it's the reanimated remains of an Orcus cultist, and that's fine, but to me it's sort of needlessly specific. There's some cool stuff about how Orcus knows everything a Bodak sees or hears, and Orcus can speak through the Bodak if he so chooses, but I think it's just as cool to say a Bodak is the remnants of a Vecna cultist, or the result of a failed attempt at Lichdom. They themed this little guy after Orcus because he has a couple of cool death powers that make him a formidable enemy. But he'd have all those same powers if he were a Vecna cultist or a failed attempt at the Lich, or whatever background you think is cool. First of all, he has a very 4th edition D&D power. He has an aura of annihilation that radiates out damage to everyone within 30 feet. That's badass. It's only 5 hit points, but eating 5 hit points around just to hang out near this guy is pretty nasty. Then he's got his Death Gaze, which is the star of the show. It's a passive ability and works basically like a Medusa's Gaze, where unless you avert your eyes, you have to make a con save, and if you fail, you take some damage. If you fail by more than five, you die. Which seems extreme, except that's basically what a Medusa does. Ah, uh, save or die. We hate you, but we sort of can't live without you. He can punch you for 2d8 plus 1d4, which is pretty meaty for a punch, but... It's not going to ruin anyone's day. The gaze and aura are his superpowers. He's got an AC of 15, so your melee guys are going to be hitting him pretty often. The Bodak holotype has 58 hit points, which your players will chew through pretty fast, but you can give him up to 90 hit points before you've even entered the realm of house ruling this guy. He has no bad saves, really, and he's resistant to just about everything, except magic weapons, and he is straight up immune to lightning, for no obvious reason. This is what makes him really nasty for a low-level party. If it wasn't for the resistances and the immunities, I think a third level party could fight a solo Bodak. But if they don't have magic items, they're going to have a bad day. Like, remember how we used to play D&D? Good times. That kind of day. 
Against a fifth or sixth level party, I'd expect a Bodak to be one monster in a larger encounter. Maybe the main monster, but not the only one. Give them some shadows or whites to keep the players on their toes. If your players are much higher level than that, I'd expect to see more than one of these in an encounter. Of course, this all depends on your party's magic item allotment. Okay, so we covered ghouls and ghasts and whites, and we covered banshees and ghosts, and we threw in bodaks for good measure. That seems a goodly amount. There are more undead. There are tons more undead, but there's lots of other stuff I want to cover in these videos. And I, there are more undead. There are tons more undead, but these are what I think of as the basic, the meat and potatoes undead. Everything else is, I think, more specialized. That's it, folks. That's the second and maybe last, who knows, undead video. We may do another series on demons and devils because there are tons of those. And it gets, I think, pretty confusing which is which and which should you pick for your encounter. But we got lots of other videos to get to before that. I don't know what we'll do next. Maybe the Appendix N video that I've been threatening to throw at you folks for a million years. We still have a couple more episodes in the politics series. Oh, and dice math. And there's just uh, more settings, you know, uh, uh, doing a tour of the different settings, probably a whole series. Also, I'd like to start live streaming. I mean, before we do our live stream game, I'd like to start live streaming again regularly. And I thought it might be fun to build an adventure together. I don't know when we're going to start that, but come by if you want. If you if you ever are worried that I'm going to start live streaming and you're going to miss it, that's one of the reasons people follow me on Twitter. There's a link to my Twitter, among other things, in the doobly-doo. As usual, there are no ads in front of my videos because I, I hate ads. Don't we all have ad block anyway? But if you want to help support the channel, you can come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly-doo. I am a independent fantasy author. Actually, I have a comic book coming out. I'm the writer on the Critical Role, the official Critical Role comic book published by Dark Horse. And in fact, we'll probably do, the comic comes out Wednesday, and I'll probably do a short video just talking about the comic for the day of its release. So that's probably the next video you're going to get, but it's going to be really short. Short. All right, folks, hope the Undead videos were useful. Let me know what you think. I mean, literally, I hate it when I hate it when channels go, let me know what your opinion is. Uh, I, I actually want to know whether or not the Undead videos are useful or not, because that will help me judge whether or not to make the Demon series. Until next time, peace out. Ow, 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 ow.